Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Doctors of Running podcast, where we, a group of doctors of physical therapy, discuss the art and science of running and the stuff that we put on our feet. Today at the round table is Dr. Matthew Klein, the founder of Doctors of Running, and myself, Nathan Brown. I'm a contributor as well. And we are going to be having a pretty unique episode to what we usually do tonight. What we're going to do, we do have some shoe topics that we're going to talk about. We're going to discuss some differences that we have seen between shoes that are good for walking versus those that may be good for running, or which ones have some overlap between the two types of movement. And then we're going to talk about a category of shoe that Matt is testing a recent shoe in. And I'm going to talk about some sizing issues that I've had this year and how I've handled it. And then we're going to work into a bit more of a casual conversation about what it's like to be a dad who's also, we've both changed jobs into uh, academia and teaching at universities in physical therapy programs and balancing our hobby of running. And so we're going to talk about what's a day in the life look like for us, how we manage all of those different responsibilities and look forward to hearing from you all in terms of how you as you're balancing all of your life things, how you do that on your end. And we can all learn from each other and the challenges, how we've gone to solutions and things like that. Before we go into all of that, though, we do want to remind you that this episode is brought to you by Scratch Labs. They have partnered with us. And one of the things that they're doing for all of you is they gave a code that you can get 25% off your first order using DOR24. So if you have not used that code yet, it's a great uh It's a great opportunity to get 25% off some products and try some out if you're looking to try some new strategies for feeling in the fall. We all get along with it really well, which is why we we all, meaning all six of us on our team, get along well with their products in terms of our stomach. And so that's why we've gone that way. One thing I wanted to get your opinion on for our subjective is not all of you probably followed when we did a, a social takeover for them, but what we did is we gathered a bunch of questions and then we answered the questions or gave responses to the questions over about 30 to 60 seconds on their stories for a day. And what I want to hear from is those of you who did follow that, did you like that format of getting information from us? Because if you did, that's something that we could do more often, even on our own channel, potentially to give a little bit more content to some of the answers. I know usually we do our mailbag episodes for the podcast, but we'd love to hear from you if that's something that would be beneficial for our socials. That'd be great. But let's go into our first topic for the night, Matt. I want to hear from you on this new shoe that you're testing and what you've been thinking about regarding stability and this shoe. Yeah. So the new shoe, thanks for the intro. Great as always. Um, new shoe is a New Balance 860 version 14. And so I was kind of been, I, this shoe's been out for a little bit. Nathan was really nice enough to be able to coordinate for a few of us to get a pair. And I was just curious because it's a very stand what's the classic stability shoe? The X60 has been around for a while. It's been very standard where it's been a immediately posted shoe. And they stood by that until recently where the stability has really changed from what previously was the post. Now this kind of film that they're using that if, if I was to analyze this actually looks like a wedge. And so what I wanted to talk about as stability is diversifying so much is what's a wedge, What's a post? How is this compared to some of the stable neutral stuff that we're seeing and and what's going on with that? And the reason I like this is because this design is not common. In fact, the last time I've seen this, this overtly has been the New Balance Vongo, which we really, really enjoyed because of its uniqueness. The version five people really like version six was very different. We kind of lost that unique tool that worked for a lot of people. And so I think it's come back in this shoe. And that's why I wanted to talk about it. Yeah. So, Talk about a little bit of the difference between what a wedge and a post would be. Yeah. So a a post is kind of the most common thing you'll hear us talk about when it comes to stability, although they are disappearing really quickly in the stability shoe category. A post is where they take and the Horizon 7 from, uh, for those of you who are watching on YouTube can see this, but the Horizon 7 for those listening is a great example of there's just a firmer uh, piece of material on the usually medial side. There's some shoes that actually do it lateral, but a firmer medial bit of material that when your foot like rolls into, if you are moving excessively one direction, it's supposed to be able to help slow down the motion so you can control it better. Doesn't actually stop the motion as we found from the research, but it's just a harder medial piece of material that's just a, a higher density than the rest of the foam. A wedge wedge is different than that because it's actually slanted so that instead of having a material that your foot just falls into and collapses, the wedge is actually meant to keep your foot at an angle. So instead of being, you know, if you're thinking like a level surface, the post 
doesn't change or lift up any part of your foot, right? The, yes, the harder you collapse foam, maybe there's some possible changes with that. But the wedge actually holds your foot up at an angle, usually facing a little bit medial, which some people work well with posts. Some people may need that wedge device if, let's say, there's certain parts of your foot anatomy that might be elevated or in a position that raising the ground up to that area actually helps. So the wedge is actually raising things up rather than you having to collapse into the material itself. If that yeah, makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. And yeah. one of the traditional ways that wedges were used clinically was for people with arthritis in their knee. They thought that if we could put a wedge that would tilt the foot in a certain way, if it was either in or out, that would yeah. change the angle of your shin, which would change the amount of loading on the inside or outside of the knee. And so it's interesting that it's coming back. I remember one of the first stability shoes that I ran in ever, and this was pre Doctors of Running, was the Brooks Ravenna. And they ah. had they had kind of that wedge uh, strategy as well, and I could feel it. So mm -hmm. when you when you talk about this shoe, how does the feel of the wedge compare to the feel of say what we're seeing in the new GT two thousand from Asics? Yeah. So and I will say that GT two thousand has been very different because they're doing like that internal geometry kind of thing where you are collapsing it. Once you go in, there's kind of what I understand. And someone please correct me if I'm misunderstanding this is that there are pillars kind of of material inside that the more you collapse into them, they tend to actually firm up and give you more resistance. So the gel Keanu, for those watching, um, has some of that, although they're also doing something very different with a medial piece of material that's actually softer and more resilient. Yeah. And it actually bounces your foot back out. So they're doing the exact opposite. But so what it feels like is it definitely, this is most prominent, I will say, in the midfoot and the heel, especially in the heel. So I did feel that pressure, kind of like that that pseudo post feeling. Like most people that you've, you've tried a shoe that's posted, you'll feel like kind of this firmer material pushing up into your heel, your arch or wherever. I immediately felt kind of like full leg pressure, especially along the heel and midfoot and then felt like my foot was just getting slightly tilted out a little bit which is why i got really excited when i put it on because i'm like oh this is a wedge like i don't know if this is going to work for me but the fact that we now have this option means there's going to be people who are actually going to do well and i will say if you look at this shoe that wedge design actually extends the full length of the shoe where i can mm -hmm. feel it even a little bit in the forefoot it's not as aggressive but it just feels like kind of the medial side of your foot is just getting raised a little bit compared to the lateral that shoe would be terrible for me. That, yeah. That I never got all, and, and that's not the, that, that's kind of your right. point is you're yeah. really excited. You really like that the shoe exists, not because right. it's the best way to do stability, but it's mm. a different way. And so yes. having it as an option may pop out at the right time. Right. But for me with my like lateral ankle instability, yeah. when I feel pitched out, I'm, I just feel like I am on the edge of something bad for just rolling Yeah, those ankle. people with lateral <laughs> ankle stabilities, this is like a no go for, this is like a no shoe yeah. for you. Yeah. Um, it's actually something I'm, I'm trying to get miles in right now. But for like, for me, I notice when I actually get my, I get pitched too far lateral in shoes, my IT band starts yes. to get really grumpy That's on my, my lateral issue. knee. And as soon as I started running in this shoe, I felt that I'm like, okay, I'm, Already a little like stress isn't the right word, but a little overwhelmed with getting used to a new environment, trying to get used to a new academic position, moving all of a sudden. Like there's, there's, and I'm not sleeping super well. So like there's already a higher threshold of stress. I'm not ready for this shoe yet because I think it might irritate something. So I'm gonna have to back off and see whether it work. But like I said, even though it, I don't know if it's gonna work for me, that doesn't mean it's not a good shoe because it's an option that we haven't seen for a while for certain populations. Right. That's great. Anything else you want to say about the shoe before we move forward? Yeah, it is lighter than I expected. It's still on that kind of like 10. I have to remember the specs, but it's like 10.5, 10.6 ounces. So it's definitely not light, but it's it feels much lighter and much smoother than the prior version. I think version 13 was kind of a little bit more of that traditional, slightly clunky stability shoe. This has really gotten to that much more rocker, smoother, a little bit stiffer. But adding that wedge component makes it definitely feel like a unique product that I'm very excited to see and get more miles on and, and hopefully help people that are looking for that specific product find it. Right. If it works for them. Yes. All right. The other thing that we wanted to talk about before we got into the full part of this episode is something that I've experienced this year in terms of shoe fit. And so something at Doctors of Running that we are trying to improve on and do differently is that if there is a shoe that we get in our typical size and it doesn't fit how we'd want. We like, oh, if only this was a little bit bigger, I might actually like it. 
what we're going to do is we're going to try to have the opportunity to test in the size up or down, depending on what we have going on. So I've done that for two particular models this year, and it's worked out fantastic. Uh, and I, and I want to talk about those two. So they are the SC trainer version three from new balance and the deviate three from Puma. And so when I tested the SC trainer version two, the way that the upper was cut on the lateral side and even on the medial side where it was tapering in, I, I, it was too tight and it was encroaching my feet and it was just uncomfortable to run in. I got blisters. It was not, not super great. And then I didn't even run in version two of the deviate nitro because of how low volume the upper was. I just put it on and I've been going through my foot stuff and I was like, I'm not going to do it. So this time I'm usually men's size nine. I got men's size nine and a half. And although both of these probably fit a little bit long, the amount of volume that has been given to me in this early part of the forefoot, and then the taper is now directed further down. It's really fit fantastic for some of those easier, longer efforts and getting kind of some daily mileage stuff out of both of these models. And so I would say for myself across the board with Puma half size up is going to be the way that I'm going to go in the future. They've all been fitting a bit snug, especially their racing models for myself. And then with new balance, I've talked about this on the podcast before, but for the SC line, and then even some of their higher end stuff like the Balos and those shoes, they all fit really low volume and have that really severe taper in the forefoot right now. And until they switch their shaping for this, these types of models, I'm going to be going half size up. So I'm really glad that I decided to make that decision this year to try half size up for some of these things. Um, and I just wanted to share which two lines of shoes worked well for me with that. I will say, and I, I, this is very hypocritical. Um, that we I've talked about before that you should not be married to your traditional shoe size. And I think runners typically tend to be a little bit better about this, trying to get the kind of the best thing. Um, but as brands come out, there's variations in sizes that happen. Just, you know, one shoe between one brand or one brand or even one model might not fit the same. And you have to be ready to go. You know what? If I actually want to, if this shoe is working for me and all the other parts, I might want to consider a different size just to make sure things are lining up. Comfort's really important. So don't get married to your size. Although I am struggling with that too, because I'm used to being a size 10. And then every once in a while, like the Brooks Ghost Max 2 is one of the shoes that fit me so short that I really should have gone, you know what? I really need to consider a half size up, but I didn't and ran through it with some blisters and some mild toe bruising just because I'm like, I'm going to get the miles and move on. But <laughs> Yeah, we try to make those recommendations. And so I'm also having this weird situation right now where, and people, especially anybody who's been pregnant knows this a lot better than me, but my feet seem to be chasing shape slowly. And so yeah, I am getting I closer too. to what I suspect to be almost a 10 and a half. And it's funny you said that with the SC Trainer version threes, I've had the same thing where it just fits slightly short and tapered on huh. me. I'm like, should I have done yeah. a Maybe. 10 and a half? The one thing yeah. I'll say about this one I, is that the heel is wider. So mm. like I have to snug it down a yeah. little bit on the SC trainer. Uh, the volume through the heel and the midfoot is a little big, but the length and volume at the forefoot's awesome. The, <laughs> this shoe, if I got a size down, I would not be able to run in it because it, it would, yeah. this, the, the deviate nitro three is pretty, pretty snug, even in this size, but good snug because it's okay. stretchy. It's a stretchy upper. So it feels, feels really good. All right, let's transition into our conversation tonight. It's just like, what's it like being, you know, switching jobs yeah. to being a professor now at George Fox too. You've moved yeah. up north a little bit along the coast there. And then you've got new baby kind of. Now you're over kind a year into year yeah. Isabella's life, right? Yeah. Uh, and then you're also like married and you've got a new house. And so I want to hear from you, just like, what does a typical day look like for you juggling all of those different things? Yep. What's the yeah. structure of your day? Yeah, we kind of want to talk about this, by the way, because we know that being a parent and trying to be a runner and balance this stuff is really hard. And we are also trying to learn as well. But I, I will say um, one of the easiest things, I'm very lucky that both my wife and I are runners. She's, you know, the pro runner. And so that's kind of how we met. Um, we're also very lucky that we have uh, a running stroller that we can use in areas that are safe to use that. But every morning, pretty much the start of our day is a run. It's, oh, it's also me like dragging Regina and Isabella out of bed, trying to get everybody <laughs> ready and getting coffee ready. Cause I'm the, 
morning, the morning person. Per- okay, who's hold on. Ready. Yeah. So okay, yeah. so what time do you wake up? So typically, my like mental alarm clock. Also, the cats wake me up at about five five thirty. Okay, and then are you waking Il- Isabella up from sleep? Sometimes. Okay. And what Sometimes. time do you guys get out the it's door? I'm just Regina. curious. Yeah, it's Regina that I'm trying to wake up. I'm afraid to wake up <laughs> Isabella because she sometimes doesn't wake up very well. Right. So I've definitely changed diapers while she was still asleep early yeah. in the morning. Uh, we're still co-sleeping, by the way. We have not made – her bed, her room is ready, but we have not made that transition to yeah. getting her to sleep on her own yet. We're going to slowly work on it. But, yeah. yeah, it's usually me waking up Regina and then me going and getting stuff ready and then trying to get those two to, like, wake up and then let's go. So – Kind of what time are you out the door to run that can if it's a good day i can get them out get them get them out <laughs> early by six ish if it's not as great it'll take till seven ish and then i start panicking because i've got to get home really quick and get to work right fortunately i'm lucky in la i had an hour plus drive now i have a 10 minute drive to george wow. Fox, so it makes life a little bit better that's a game but, changer yeah so you go, you so, do that run, you come home, you eat, yep. shower. Usually shower, and then I'm like eating something either that I've made or something compact as I drive to George Fox. Okay. Yeah. Hey, what's your job like right now? I guess it's brand it's, new, but. Yeah, it's it's just me. It's been a little bit different in terms of when I was at my previous institution, I was just thrown in. I had to like create courses from scratch and do all this stuff, and it was very overwhelming. This has been like a, hey, you're, you know, full-time faculty, but just you're going to be assisting two other faculty with their courses and get used to things. And um, nice. I feel like I'm putting a lot of pressure on myself to get, like basically be a student again. I'm doing all the reading. I'm doing the assignments. I'm doing all the stuff. Just got to get figure out kind of how things work here and getting used to true academia with George Fox is really good about developing their faculty, especially in the first year and all the requirements and learning the system and all the personalities. So it's, it's a lot, it's, it's somewhat relaxed, but also like taking in a lot of information at the same time. Supportive. It sounds supportive. Like it's a very, very supportive, supportive yeah. atmosphere. Yeah. They're constantly yeah. telling me like, like, am I going to have to do that? Like, calm down. You're, you're just relaxed. Like, take it, chill out. Like, <laughs> take it one day at a time. We know you're overwhelmed. It's, it's fine. But how do you yeah, handle, a lot of changes. How do you yeah. handle being told to relax? Are you able to do that? They don't say it exactly like that, but it's sure. insinuated to be like, you're going to be okay. Like, just breathe. Um, I think it does help me, but like, I'm also the highly caffeinated ADHD, like anxious individual who will create anxieties for himself anyway. So it like somewhat helps. Like it's like, it's like massage guns or foam rolling. It'll help for about like 15, 20 minutes and then (laughs) it'll come right back. So what time do you get home after work? It totally depends on what time class ends. So I've got some days where I'm only there for like an hour because this is a brief lecture. There's other days I'm there for like three to four hours from like eight to 12. All my classes thus far have been in the morning. And so the afternoon's off. And so I'll usually rush home, trade places with Regina and she'll go to work as a board certified behavior analyst. And I'm with Isabella in the afternoon. Okay. So it can be like one, two o'clock usually. Yeah. Yeah. And then do you have, how do you fit in all of the prep and other work that you do because the life in academia what i'm learning is pretty it's it's this really unique balance between like really flexible and really demanding where the the job is never ever ever done in academia Mm -hmm. whereas my clinic life like it's the, the my faculty members that i get to work with are amazing they're super supportive and they've been doing it much longer than i have and so there's these idiosyncrasies that I sometimes point out and they're like, wow, I didn't even think about that. You know, like that's how that works. Like for me, yep. jobs, when I was so used to being a clinician, it was at eight o'clock, the person comes in at eight forty five. the next person comes in at nine 30, the next person comes in and there's a start and an end to the job. You finish the paperwork and it's a completed task. And yep. the, the day was, and I was a staff PT. So it was, that was, you know, you, you saw the person you did, you helped them as best you could and you moved forward. Whereas I've noticed that in this new job, there are about 300, 3000 tasks that need to get completed at some point and they're never actually ever done. And so mm-hmm. you have to strategically pick what you're going to work on and when. And then I've noticed that I go in with my day with a plan and then this one little thing pops up and I actually, my whole day was spent on that new thing and I didn't get anything on my to-do list yeah. done. And I was like, have you ever, do you know, does that happen for you? And they're like, oh, that's just what this job is like. Yeah. And, and I was like, that's a unique thing about this, 
and, and I am learning now how to do that. And I haven't mm-hmm. fully figured it out. I have different systems that I'm developing for task management and things like that, but it's a very different thing. Or uh, like the obvious too is when the students come in the doors, I'm available for them. So that might be an hour, hour and a half for, with one student, depending on their needs at that moment. And it's, it's such a rewarding yeah. job, but working in academia is different. So anyway, so I just asked you a question then talked for like 10 minutes. And I okay. think my question was, you know, you have the teaching side, but how do you, how do you fill in the rest of the responsibilities with the yeah. job? Yeah. I'm still learning that to be honest. Cause it's like three weeks in, we actually yeah. just finished our first week. We're starting our second week as when this uh, podcast comes out, but it's kind of like, I get to it when I can, a lot of it's done when Isabella is asleep and Regina's asleep. So I'm still up in the other room while they're out and like trying to get stuff done and, you know, seeing how much I can get each day. Um, I think doing a PhD for years really helps because you just like mm. you're just grinding and trying to get it done. But it's challenging having a one year old because you can't just ignore her for long periods. Like she's, you know, it's Virginia and I being a parent's really important when to be present for her. So like trying to engage her a lot when she's awake and then waiting for those moments when she's asleep to really get stuff done. But trying to get into deep work in those brief, potentially brief or potentially long moments is really hard. So there's a lot of like trying to get things done when you can. And a lot of it's like, I know I've like, hence the, the comment on my IT band and the, and the 860 going, yeah, I'm not getting a lot of sleep right now because that's mostly where I can fit it in. So if I know my sleep's getting sacrificed, I know I'm at greater risk for injury. So I'm going to be very careful with what I do. I know, right. right? It's one of those, one of those things, you know, it's, yeah, it's kind of random because I'm still building a schedule and having a one-year-old yeah. almost like takes that out. Yeah. So it's, when I can. And yeah, it's the 3000 list task that keeps adding more things. You're just like, I, there's some things I can get done. There's something I can't, it's a very unique yeah. job that you mm-hmm. looks like flexible on paper, but there's always something you got to be working on. Right. And how late are you? How are you, do you stay up late at night or what's your, what's your gig with that? Haven't you noticed some of the doctors running reviews that get finished at like 12 o'clock at <laughs> night for some reason? You're like, Randall, like, Bach, by the way, this is done. Then I send it out to the entire group and it's like 12 o'clock, 12 30. I'm trying not to do that because I, I definitely know the impact of a lack of sleep. But yeah, it's that, that after nine o'clock is that rising grind. See how long I can stay awake <laughs> and get whatever I can done. But there have been times in our chat yeah. where Matt says, I fell asleep while writing this review. I'll finish yeah. it tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So working yeah, on, so, I feel like we're all works in progress on our, yeah, we are uh, on definitely our work in progress. Yeah. yeah. I'm still definitely learning my rhythm. So it's you run change it, do you run every day? Yes. Right now? Every day. Um, I know that's not always advice. We say don't, don't always do what we do, but part of it is just, I've always done very well with consistency and having some kind of schedule. So Regina and I definitely will run every single morning, whether that's an easy run, a workout or whatever. It's just part of our day with Isabella in the stroller. Um, there are some times that my brain, I just need to move again. So I, I do okay, the occasional like shorter double in the evening and they'll take Isabella with me. Not every day anymore. I've been taking some days where I'm like, I just need it's to just sit with Isabella or I just need to like mess with her or I need to lift some weights. So that's been a good time, but yeah. at, every morning for sure with probably three to four doubles, shorter runs in the evening. Mm, cool. Yeah, my my schedule is a little bit different than yours, I would say. Mm-hmm. Um I have not been well, so Jana doesn't run. Um, so I'm I'm the only person who enjoys running at this phase of our my kids' lives. And so my my pattern is I usually only run right now like three days a week. And when I do run, I wake up at about four forty five mm-hmm. and try to be able to go to the bathroom so I don't have issues on the run. <laughs> and then uh, I, I usually start my run around 5.15 and try to get home and showered. Our kids wake up at 7. And so like my goal is to have all of the running stuff done and showered and ready for the day by 7 so that when they get up, I can just be there. And so then, yeah, I, I do that. And then they get up at 7. I usually have quick breakfast with them. And then I head out to work. So I usually am getting to work between 7.30 and 8 in the morning. And I hang out there usually somewhere between 4 and 5.30. Um, Depends on classes. Depends on if I'm picking the kids up from school. Um, I guess we're just starting a new semester. I, I drop the kids off once a week and I pick them up once a week from school. And so that puts some parameters on when I leave and come back or whatever to to leave work. 
but yeah, then I, I kind of talked about my work rhythms, but what I try to do at work is I, what I'm trying now, because there's so many different tasks, I've tried to categorize them and put blocks in my schedule that are dedicated to those different categories of tasks. So whether if it's class course prep is one like chunk or for right now I'm working on my dissertation. So there's a couple of dissertation chunks in my day that it's just like everything else should get shut out, just work on the dissertation. And then there's other parts that it's like, okay, office hours, very open for students. And then advising, I have some advisees for school or that are in the first year students. And so I have chunks set aside for that. And I'm trying to chunk my day so that I don't get too scattered. Cause I feel like the most important thing to me is whatever is staring me in the face. And so if I don't dedicate time ahead of, ahead of time, I'm going to miss out on doing the thing that's actually most important because I just saw an email and I'm going to go down that rabbit hole. And I found that to be really helpful, but still like I'm working on how to actually make that operationalized. but that's what I'm trying to do right now. But yeah, then I come home in the evening. I never run doubles ever. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the evenings are like we do dinner as a family and then play until the kids go to bed at seven. And then Jan and I usually hang out um, doing whatever we want to do that night, whether if it's like just sit and read or watch a show or sit outside or whatever it is, and then try to go to bed. I usually am tired, go to bed at like 10, 10 30, but my productivity is terrible in the evening. And so I try to get my, as much done as I can during the work day and then shift back home. And Right now, you know, like everybody has to figure out their patterns of life. Like for me, um, I can give myself the chunk of like a pretty traditional like work day because Jana is home right now full time and she's loving that. And this is the first year that Ray is starting 4K. So we have all kids in school for at least part of the day, four days a week. And so Jana is starting to think about like when they're both full time, what do I want my time and energy to look like, but doesn't have any conclusions yet. So I understand mm. that that's a very unique yeah. spot that get, affords me a lot right. of opportunity to compartmentalize my time in ways that not everybody can. Um, but I think what's been most helpful for balance because running is so healthy for me. I, if I'm not running, I'm I in exercising just like the benefits of exercise and through running Running is my friend time. Like I run with friends every Thursday and Saturday. And so we have, I have enough crazy friends that get up early to run together, which is really nice. And we just have coffee afterwards. Um, so I'd miss out on friend time. I'd miss out on the exercise. And so it's really important to have it in there because I, I would, I probably wouldn't be as good of a dad, husband worker if I, if I'm not getting all that exercise. And I experienced that in a decent way when I was off uh, with the injury for a while, it just was a little bit different. Um, Not devastatingly so, but I could just tell like internally it was a little bit less peace filled and (laughs) joyful in some ways. But on that line, how have you found that like running has helped you as a professor, dad, parent, husband, whatever, or what ways have they conflicted with each other? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I'd say it helps because that's been kind of one of the foundations of Virginia's relationship, right? Like we spend at least once, if not twice, a day together. If not, if we're even if we're super busy, those are going to be our major times together. Well, the the second one you usually have to pull her, despite being the pro runner, I'll have to pull her out. Going, I don't want to run. And I'm like, now you're coming running anyway. <laughs> um, I think the other great thing is that now with it put me pushing the stroller, it becomes like our general family time. So Isabella yeah. can hear us talk. She's, she's babbling. She's getting words here and there, but she gets a chance to speak. We respond to her. So it's kind of like this great combination of something that's important to all of us that we get to spend time together, yeah. which as you know, a, what we're watching is life is getting crazier and crazier. And so it's going to be really important because Isabella is going to be going to daycare soon. Our schedules are going to get busier as we kind of learn and get rhythm and, you know, schedules pick up. Um, What is, and uh, what's, I don't know if I'm going to call this challenging. I'm going to call it modifying expectations. So some of you that have been listening to so well may know that recently I've been very averse to things like marathons and things like that. And that's because realistically, 
you know, I don't want Isabella to be in the stroller for two plus hours. And we really don't have the time to put that kind of training. So our training is really sh- because of doing this together, having mm-hmm. a kid, it shifted to going, we're going to be do focusing on speed work because it takes less time. It's a little more intense and it gets, it's, and it's just more efficient for us at this stage of life yeah. to go, okay, I can't be out there for a two, three hour run. Um, but I can be out there for like, you know, 40, 50 minutes, hammer the track next door that we're very like lucky to be next to and be done. So we can then get Isabella out and still have some time for her to play. Um, right. hoping that we can evolve this as she gets older into her riding a bike or maybe running a little bit with us, but we'll have to see what happens, but it, it's shifting our expectations. And one of the other things I will also say too, is that pushing the stroller has changed my expectations of what pace I expect out of myself. I've like totally let go of any like pace it when I'm running anything from like a 200 meter repeat up to doing a long run. There's no expectation of pace because I'm pushing this 25 pound little one plus another 25 pounds in the stroller. And so I'm like, dude, I'm getting a workout either way. So I'm not going to worry what the pace is. So it's very liberating, but also like, I'm not going to worry about a training plan. I'm just taking in each day and no matter what I do, yeah. it's going to be a good workout. Like we did a long run up, te- long up tempo run. So we did 11 miles, um, an average about seven minute pace up at, mm. uh, uh, the Fairmont loop up in, in Portland. And, uh, it was one of the hardest things I have done in like years. I, my, we stopped really suddenly. And then I started getting all this like phlegm and felt like I was choking and realized like my heart, we just hadn't cooled down and my heart rate just spiked. And so I had to like calm myself down, do some diaphragmatic breathing, like get my heart rate to like slowly mm. drop because it did, or like to, to modulate because it had dropped too quickly. And I was starting to get some symptoms going, Oh, that was really hard. So it's, just modifying that. I think what, how I've approached being a parent is just figuring out how do, how do I modify things, modify my expectations, modify training to match it with a little one and realizing, yeah, I can't go run the, not that I want to. I can't run a hundred miles a week anymore. I can't, you know, have that focus on like, Oh, I want to like make the Olympic trials or make this. But honestly, I'm not focused on that. It's just the focus on let me get out every day or however long much I can. Right. And then try to s- resemble some health here and knowing my kind of focus has changed a little bit, but yeah. not totally let it go. If that right. makes sense. Totally. Yeah. I I'm hearing from you, like a lot of the, you have these internal priority list yeah. that shakes out in how you make decisions yes. and you're yeah. allowing things to shift to meet those higher priorities. Right. And then those other ones take a back seat for a time, but are still yeah. integrated for overall right. health. Cause what I've noticed and our kids aren't that old, you know, seven and five, which is not, like no time, but I know that people, there's so many, what I've noticed in seven years is what I was going to say. What I've noticed in seven years is that every single phase, which can happen every six months, depending on the season or every year or so, what it looks like and what the kids need like changes. And for right. me, like priority of like Jana's well being and the kids well being is much higher than my running priority. Right. And so I can try to shift all of my running to help with their well being. And right now, the boys sleep until seven, which has given me a great window of time to engage in something that I love to right. do. And what I also love about running as a parent is like my although my boys don't see me run because I'm running while they're sleeping, they know I'm running. They know that I get up early to take care of myself and be healthy. And I do it and they know I do it early so that I can be with them. Mm -hmm. Like they, they understand that. And I think that's valuable for them too. They're like, wow, my dad could just wait till I'm awake and then go run and not play with me. But I purposely do it at a time where I can be with them. Similar for you. You y'all do it. Humi- like, like as a or communally is what I was yeah. going to say. So yeah. I think it's really fun to see that my kids be able to see there's dedication to taking care of himself. He has friends that he hangs out with. Mm-hmm. Even as an adult, he um, does something that's kind of hard and like they'll tomorrow I'm running like a labor, a local labor day yes. run thing. And they're probably going to come like watch me run it. And they'll see me like, work really hard at something. And I also like that, that they're seeing someone that they work, hang out with every day, do something that makes them very uncomfortable. And I hope that my kids grow to appreciate doing things that are uncomfortable that are still good for them. And I, that's what I love about running and how they get to see me engage in it. 
Um, not because I'm going to go win a race tomorrow, but far from it, but they'll get to see me work hard at something, enjoy it, maybe fail. Yep. Um, and so I, I do like that symbiotic nature between how my running influences like my kids and yeah. my kids have biked with me um, from time to time when I'm running. But a lot of it has been again in time where I can make sure that their well being is the priority over just like my running engagement. But if I'm not healthy, I'm not going to be as good of a dad. So I have to figure out how to piece the puzzle together. But that's that's been a like you said, kind of a challenge. But yeah, not negative. It's just how, what does it look like now? And it has to change all the time. My goals are not marathoning right now. Right. As much as I want to, it's not the most feasible thing and it wouldn't be the healthiest thing for our family. So yeah, how the priorities sit in the list dictate how it shakes out in a day to day thing. That's funny that the two of us, cause I do the same thing. Yours is much more organized than mine. We were talking earlier about, Oh, how do you organize <laughs> your day? And I'm like, literally feel like I'm just putting out fires, which is also kind of <laughs> how my brain works <laughs> totally too, which is why one of the greatest things as a clinician was doing residency and fellowship and building a forced structure to go start here and improv off the structure, which is also how I teach going. Yeah. Like, Hey, this is, I'm very adaptable when I need to be sometimes too much. So having a structure to build off of, and then being able to go from there is key. And that's the same kind of way that I think about teaching, especially students coming in as well as like how we're structuring our training right now. It's like, there's no like crazy ideas. It's just like, here's kind of the basic things we know we need. Let's put those in there and then get creative with trying to adapt it around whatever happens. And I think that's a similar thing. What I've tried to do with some students is, you know, Hey, this is kind of how I teach the, my George Fox students haven't quite gotten this out yet because they're just getting small pieces of me as I slowly integrate in. And these are not my courses yet. Right. right. So I'm just, I'm assisting and supporting. Right. Um, but I will say answering your other part of your question, how does that influence how your husband, how you're like a professor is just trying to model that same thing you talked about totally. of getting out for some kind of exercise a couple of days a week. I think, Every grad student, every student gets when they transition, things are really hard, right? Just like being a new parent's really hard. So when you get like you're faced starting a new program with this in, immense intensity going, oh my gosh, this is a doctor or this is this kind of degree. How am I going to get through this? And it's very easy to fall into the trap of, I just need to study 24 hours a day. I can't be doing anything else. And that's really not healthy. If you right. get into that situation, your health will, will fall. And you may not actually be the best learner because we know that the best learners are the ones that are actually bounced where they're getting enough sleep. They're exercising two things that actually help with memory retention, with with uh, memory formation and problem solving and overall health. So hopefully what I can show the students is, yes, I'm still running every day or however often I'm able to. And I'm able to integrate this despite having a very busy life. I want to show you how to take care of yourself and still be uncomfortable at the same time going, I can, I can push, right? Like it's mm -hmm. okay to be uncomfortable. That's where you grow. And if you seek out appropriate, uh, what's the term I'm looking for? Appropriate situations where you have an opportunity to perform while uncomfortable. It's great. It's, it's like doing an evaluation. I still get anxiety with new patients. Every single person that comes see me, there's still some anxiety that I'm like, am I going to do this? Well, what's going to happen? And it's like, then you just get into it. And things tend to work out. Yeah. So, yeah, I would agree. And they tend that, to work out because yeah. of the work you put in on the front right. end. It does not just, yeah, doesn't just happen. Right. So, trying I, to, trying so we to just got to get you that. more sleep is what I'm hearing. That's yeah, the only basically. piece. <laughs> yeah. But I also know I chose to be, I was lucky enough, Regina and I chose to be parents. So, that was something yeah. that we knew going in was going, all right, this is just part of it. And if it's, it's an investment in, in another human being. And so, we'll make this work and modify this yeah. as we need to. That's great. I was going to say the same thing about, um, about students is that being a, being a, in a teaching or professor role, it's the first time I've had kind of some form of leadership within it. And so within how I develop relationships with the students in our program, I try to lead with a lot of vulnerability and authenticity so that they see my real life. Because like you said, Physical therapy school is one example of a life season that could take over everything of yep. you because it's very, very demanding. And so if I also enter into being currently in grad school again and teaching and having kids and all of these things, and I am a super unhealthy person, 
I want them to see when I'm unhealthy so that they can help, you know, see how ways that I have to pull myself back. And I also want to see ways that I promote health within my life, because like you said, and our program is really, really good at this and promoting overall like holistic wellness for students and giving them opportunities for that. And, uh, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. So I try to mm-hmm. lead with that vulnerability and authenticity so that they can see that I'm not some pedestal person by any <laughs> yeah, stretch of the imagination. Uh-uh. It's like, Oh, he's yeah. a person who happens to be teaching this class uh, with that. I happen to be in. So yeah. I can learn alongside of him and right. work with him. So are there any last things that you want to say about parenting and running before we wrap up? Yeah, I think, it, you know, what we talked about is how we've tried to integrate this. For those who are new parents or might maybe struggling with this, the, I think kind of the biggest thing is just being adaptable and modifying your expectations, right, in terms of going, all right, how can I get this integrated into my life if it's possible? Do I need to maybe modify how many days a week, how my relationship with this, right, like how I involve other people? I'm like, I've been super lucky that Isabella loves the stroller. And so she has no problem. She actually gets pretty excited when we we go and take her out. So to be able to go, right, so, you know, this is just going to be part of it. I love pushing that stroller. It's so hard. Like, we live in a decently hilly area again. And so, yeah, there's like a two-mile uphill loop. And I'm like, I, I, this is supposed to be an easy run, but I'm definitely at a threshold right now just trying to push this stroller up there. And I love every minute of it because I know I'm getting to do it with her. She's getting to see a variety of things. So it's just learning to modify this and we'll have to see what happens. I, I don't, I don't have any expectations of myself going, I'm going to run this race. I'm going to run this time. It's like, I'm just happy to be able to run. And maybe like, you know, when she's five, six years old and doesn't fit in the stroller, we're going to have to see how to make this work. Regina might, and I might be waking up at four o'clock like you to see if we can get miles in. Swap running times or yeah, it's just, you're right. Oh, sorry. I just dropped something, but it's really uh, it's all about adapting. Yep. And uh, in my opinion, if, if you're pri- if you don't know, I'm not saying one way to make your priorities. I'm saying if you don't know your priorities, somebody's and expectations of everybody right. involved, that's the other thing, like communication with Jana and with the boys of like, w- just the why, because if they had their way, I would never go to work. If right. I had my way, yeah. I'd also never go to work. Right. Like just hanging out with them all day would be amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, but they understand why I go to work. One, that it's like an awesome way to contribute in the lives of our community and like being involved too, so that we can like have a house and like a roof over our heads and food in our refrigerators. So like we bring them into the conversation and then Jana and I have to be on the same page of like, how do we each get what we need? Well, we're also both parenting and have full like, because her responsibilities that she's taking on right now are crazy too, because she works another online job right now too. And so it's, it's, a uh, it's all about that communication. Right. If the priority list isn't there, I feel like that's, that'd be my starting right. point. And I have to redo that a lot too. Cause I realize, Oh, just cause I say I prioritize it doesn't mean I actually do. <laughs> cause then like, I see that like my time is not showing where my priorities are at or my like, so I have to restructure and rethink about like, Oh, I say I prioritize that. How could I actually show it? The the two things based on that I was to say for those listening is a this is not easy, and I'm gonna, these two things I say to my students as well. None of this stuff is easy. It's it's hard. And the other part is we're always learning and always having to adapt. So right. if that's what hopefully people can take from this is going trying to figure just keep going trying to figure out how can I make this work, and then also being like open and adaptable. And realizing this is hard. It's not supposed to be easy, but also things that really are worthwhile and really get the most out of you and help you grow are very challenging. And so don't, don't be, even though it is hard, don't be afraid of it. Don't be afraid of making mistakes going, I could have done that better. That's, that's how you grow. So we're all growing and learning. I exactly. And I, the last thing I'll say is that I think that it can be really easy to look at other parents and who are runners lives and say one of two things one wow they got it all the all together i wish i was better and like that the second is to look at other parents and how they go about their decisions and start to judge that it, they're making the wrong decisions mm-hmm. i i think that every time i've thought that a friend of mine is doing their parenting and running or just parenting wrong 
I've gotten to know them more and be like, Mm, their situation is extremely different than mine. Their child is extremely different than mine. It has totally different needs and preferences. And so I've, I've been humbled a lot when I've thought that like, that could be done better. Like Matt in my life, if like through this, we live life very differently and like we have to, that's good <laughs> because we each have very different circumstances. So I feel like it's, there's not gonna, there's not a playbook to to balance it all well. It's got to be yeah. specific to your values and your yep. circumstances and yeah, focus your on yourself. Family. Yeah, for sure. And know that if you know, typically your life really isn't going to look like a lot of other people's because that's what makes us unique, right? It's the same thing with PT and footwear. As we're starting to realize how people respond is very different. You know how people respond to shoes is very different. There's some inherent patterns underneath there, but that's why you know people hate this. But we say it depends. We need more information first to make a recommendation because right. we need more information, and that right. information will take us down very different pathways. And so, Absolutely. focus on the individual. Absolutely. Well, thanks for joining us on this journey. And if you want to hear more from us about this sort of stuff a little bit more about our lives and how we balance the different facets of our lives, let us know. And if there's any recommendations or questions you have for us on these topics, happy to talk about it. And we're just thankful to be able to have a, a podcast like this because it forces us to get together and chat <laughs> once, pretty much once yep. a week. So it's always fun to be with you, Matt. If you want to be following along with what we're doing regarding Doctors of Running, you can always jump on our website, doctorsofrunning.com, or follow us at Doctors of Running on most social platforms to see what we're doing regarding footwear and other running health-related topics. Have a great night, everybody.